5.30 p.m. Tuesday, June 11th, the regular meeting of the Fargo Board of Education. Is there a motion for approval of the agenda? David. Uh, I approve the agenda, uh, or I make a motion to approve the agenda, and I would like to, uh, with, set aside the uh, HR addendum to discuss separately. Okay, there's been a motion for approval of the agenda with setting aside the HR addendum to discuss under business. That would be item D. Okay, there's a second by Robin. All in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Staff reports. We don't have anyone here from the FEA, do we, this evening? Okay. President then, Knudsen. Yes. Do you need to do recognition of audience? I surely am. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Sherry has signed up to speak this evening. If you'd like to come to the podium, that would be fine, and I'll read this in the meantime. We will hear comments from the public at this time. We ask that you uh, would please state your name and address for the record. We would also ask that you refrain from using this form to criticize or complain about a specific employee by name. We are interested in your comments and will li listen carefully, but we are not obligated to respond or to, to debate issues in this forum. Should you desire a written response to a specific question, you may request it. This evening, you will be allotted a maximum of four minutes. Welcome. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen of the school board. Um, I'm just gonna say that uh, I'm a little nervous. Um, one thing my husband always said that, um, you know, why get involved? <laughs> because you're not gonna change anything anyways. But the fear is if I don't get involved, that is what I fear the most, is that I won't be able to um, do something or say something that I could have said to make a change. So that's why I'm here today. On May 6, I attended a meeting at the Discovery School at the, through the Metro Cog Group. They are leading the program in the community to move to a safe routes to school program for our children to walk and ride their bikes to school. The SRTS website notes that it also creates a kind of environment that for improving air quality and the overall quality of lives for its citizens. Although boundary changes are the purpose and stimulator for my being here today, the real focus is the quality of our public spaces. The issue at hand is beauty in our neighborhoods or the lack of it. The quality of our city public spaces is poor for livability. We need to address the issue of our unsafe streets stemming from our physical environment. Spaces that are kept neat and pleasant are happier places to live. By creating attractive spaces in our neighborhoods in our city, the city is in balance and in harmony and procures to address the issue of balancing the students because more families will want to live in the inner part of the city. Why is this? Because people want to live where it is beautiful and people care about where they live and how it looks. According to Gell, there are three categories for, from the book, The Life Between Buildings, of outdoor activities, necessary activities, optional activities, and social activities. She states, streets and cities, spaces of poor quality, only the bare minimum of activities, t activities take place. People hurry home. But in a good environment that is kept clean and attractive, a completely different all around humane activity is possible. With clean and beautiful spaces, the people's attitudes will change because wherever they will live in our city, it will be clean, beautiful, and it will have the right mix of people living in the neighborhoods and schools. Do you see how our city is bland? Do you see how our trees are in poor condition due to, to bags hanging from the limbs? Do you see that our curbs are rutted with tracks by vehicles driving over the lawn? Do you see our green spaces are diminished to dirt, rubble, and weeds? Do you see how our neglect to take care of our city creates unnecessary changes? Our lack of quality spaces for our neighborhoods and public spaces destroys the ability for our children to walk or ride their bikes to school. Do you see the bad situation we are living in? 
We need to rebuild our neighborhoods for beauty and peace by developing quality neighborhoods that are attractive. The payoff is a better balance of students in our schools and stronger communities that listens to we the people. But this isn't the city's problem so much it is our problem. We need to put on our gloves, grab a, a reusable bag to pick up the litter in our neighborhoods that we have caused. It starts with a look at ourselves to resolve to clean up the areas we live, we work, and we play in, to create a more colorful and verdant urban living environment. Let me leave you with this question to ponder. Where have we locked our doors in our lives? Unlock the doors of our hearts to, to let beauty reign. So the reality of a balanced and a beautiful community reigns. And then changing of our boundaries and zoning laws will become obsolete. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. And staff reports. I am right, there's not anyone from the FEA. Missy, is there anyone sitting behind you that I don't see? Okay. Superintendent's report, Dr. Gandhi. I don't have much today since it's a summer meeting. Um, just a couple of things. We uh, will be bringing to the next planning meeting some work that administration is doing on looking at the 1930s wing of our Agassiz building. Um, we are right now are having some analysis done on both just the potential of some repairs there, the cost of removing the asbestos, looking at the footing, um, and then some potential options for that space. And then that's a conversation that we'll be bringing to planning to talk about what some future options there are as well. And then besides that, just wanted to let the board know that I will be out of town for the next couple of weeks, so I will miss the next board meeting, but we'll be able to call in, but I will be out. Thank you. Missy, I have been told that you are going to introduce the Academic Performance monitor Monitoring Report. Yes, tonight I have Jen Saar with me and we are going to go through this presentation together. Um, so one of the first things is the data that we're going to use tonight comes right from the district dashboard. So that you could go in there yourself if you wanted to review it. You could use any of the filters. It's really a robust tool um, to look at the data um, because we gave a snapshot of district level at all of these um, slides that we're going to show. The second thing is, is that I want, uh, as you're thinking about maybe questions you have for us, Make, what we're gonna look at is the data has not changed a lot. It's tentatively in almost all areas, flat or a slight decrease. And I want to just prep us for when we're looking at that data and we're thinking about our questions because of course we always want more growth for our students as we go forward. Some of the next steps are already in action planning um, as we go forward and I wanted to share that with you. Um, the first one is, is that when we think about reviewing data, we're gonna need to dig down and look at student groups, um, more in particular EL, Native American, special education, and mobility. Those are four categories that we need to look at some patterns that are going on within our student groups and look at what are we doing with differentiation to meet the needs of those students in our system. Mobility has come up multiple times in our principal meetings, and it's not mobility of coming to a different state as much as it is mobility within the city of Fargo and moving within some of our own um, buildings back and forth. And so when we think about some of those pieces, one piece that is very helpful to us is the Striving Readers Grant. We've spent most of the year planning for that. It is a five-year grant, and the focus of that is shared vision and shared practices with all of our buildings and our teachers. It is focused on our Title I buildings as we go forward, but there is a component that comes to our district level literacy committee as we go forward. So what we're working on with our strategists is that what are the shared practices we value that we wanna see for literacy? It's not, it is really the same for math, but just so you know that we have an extra um, focus through the literacy grant called Striving Readers. In fact, we had, um, a record number of teachers sign up for that striving readers training that is happening this summer. Um, because partly too, we were thinking, oh, it's in the summer, are we gonna get enough to fill all these slots? And that was not the issue that we had. The second one is the ELOs. One of the pieces that we need to look at is a guaranteed viable curriculum, especially with mobility and having students move building to building. Are we valuing, again, a shared practice, the same standards as priorities in the buildings? 
Um, our teaching and learning um, district facilitators have done a wonderful job at starting this process of priority, prioritizing the standards and ELOs. It'll be our first year implementing the ELOs as we go forward next year, which will help us with that guaranteed viable curriculum, which is your pacing, and making sure that we're, each person doesn't make their own decisions in choosing what is going to be taught. And the last one is our MTSS process. And I can tell you from being in two different districts that Fargo has a very robust MTSS process, but we're gonna really need to start pulling some sample data from there on students that are not making process after being in MTSS in level one, two, and three. What adjustments do we need to make for students if they're receiving an intervention and it's still not working? And that, that's a little more research on our part. But just wanted to kind of share those pieces so you can have those in mind as we go through the data tonight. And run the show. All right, so we're gonna start by um, taking a look at some of the reading data. And the, the first slide that we have, um, we have a sample from each of the uh, primary assessments that we give across the district. And this first one is from Ames Web Plus, which is a screening tool. We use it three times a year, and there are a variety of subtests or measures that we use depending on the grade level. Um, but the one that we have up on the screen tonight is oral reading fluency, which is administered to all of our students in grades one through five. So it is our most comprehensive screener. Um, on the, on the left side of the screen, what you're able to see then is the number or the percentage of students in grades one through five that met their yearly growth target. And this is measured from the fall of the year to the spring of the year. So depending on how the student performed on oral reading fluency in the fall, um, a, a goal is set per student. And then we take a look and see if they've met that goal in the spring and are able to determine what percentage of our students have, have met that goal. You're only seeing two data points on either side of the screen tonight because Ames Web Plus, um, we're just finished our second year with that. Prior to the plus version, we were using the classic version, which there were, there were a number of similarities, um, but yet some of the assessments, some of the measures were slightly different. So that's why you're seeing only two years worth of, of information. On the right side of the screen is where you can see the proficiency. So um, based on the national norming, uh, students across the, the country who have uh, taken part in oral reading fluency for Ames Web Plus, um, what percentage of our students were able to meet that normed target for the spring? And again, we give it three times a year. What you're seeing um, here today for the purpose of the strategic plan uh, comes back to the spring results. The second one we have is the Fontes and Pinnell Benchmark Reading Assessment. And again, this is a district score, so it is the average of K through five. It is, again, growth on the left-hand side and proficiency on the right-hand side for all students. And Jen, I'm just gonna make sure that I have it right. In the Fontes and Pinnell, you're gonna listen to a student read, and you're gonna mark um, any errors that they're having in the reading, and they give the only, thing that happens there when you have a human, right, doing that interpretation, it is a little more subjective. Um, so the, the teacher has to be the one to make that decision on how that reading is going. And so I'll probably just add a little bit to that is, um, while it's less subjective whether the student has read the word correctly or not, that tends to be pretty black and white. Um, the second piece of the, the assessment is a conversation about what they've read. And so in order to determine their level of understanding. And so um, that tends to be where we see more subjectivity, what, the, what the, the teacher brings to the table when they're listening to that student, what they know about the progress that that student has made or the level of effort that that student has put in um, over the course of the all can have impact on how um, on how a teacher may or may not respond to the students um, the students feedback in terms of how um, how their what their comprehension level was so the next series of slides all has to do with um, map again focusing on reading so the measures of academic progress um, again progress on the or made yearly growth on the left and proficiency on the right of the screen um, we administer the MAP assessment for all of our students in the winter, and that's what, that has been the, the case for the last four years. 
Um, so we measure that yearly progress from the winter of one year to the winter of the next year. So in order for us to get a percentage on the left-hand side of the screen, the student would have had to have been in our district for, for two consecutive winters in order for us to determine that, that um, that they've made that growth target. And that growth target is set by NWEA, again, based off of the initial score. So you can see, um, as we continue to work through the slides, uh, what that looks like for made yearly, prog or made yearly growth, and then on the right-hand side, the proficiency. We are in, typically MAP resets their cut scores every three years, or they, they, they do a norming study every three years to take a look at those cut scores. And we are in our fourth year of the same um, cut scores. And essentially what happened is four years ago was when uh, MAP was aligned to the Common Core State Assessment. And so those cut scores were, were normed accordingly. Um, because we no longer use the Common Core but use our state standards, they're in, an, in another norming process. So we have two more years where we've just finished our first year of collection, or the NWEA has finished their first year of collection. We'll have two more years before they reevaluate the norms and possibly make uh, decisions from there. And the map, the map test also is adaptive. So when a student takes the test, if they're doing well, they're going to be given more difficult questions. If they were struggling, it would adjust. And so we don't have that ability on, a, on any other test that I know of yet. Um, so that is one thing different with the map test. All right, so then taking a look at the North Dakota State Assessment. Um, we are, we, when you look across this piece, we don't have the opportunity to take a look at yearly growth. And so we're just looking at proficiency. And what you see on the screen um, in the black dots and lines is how our district has done by grade level for reading. And then what you're seeing in the blue bars that rise up is how the state of North Dakota has done over the course of the years, um, also related to proficiency. The North Dakota State Assessment, I would say for our district in general, has been one that um, um, probably lost a little bit of faith in, in terms of being a reliable measure of student progress early on when we made the transition to the Smarter Balance Common Core Aligned Assessment. Um, it was the first time, or not the first time, but it was a shift in time where we brought the assessment back into the spring and the results weren't available until even into the next school year. And so students and teachers who were really invested in the work that they had been doing um, weren't able to share in those celebrations together. This year is the first year that we have received those results in the same school year that the assessment was administered. Um, we're in the process as well, working with our student performance strategists and, and teachers to taking a look at how do all of these assessments come together into, into an overall proficiency uh, index score. Um, what we know about any assessment we give is that there are lots of variables. We talked a little bit about subjectivity with the benchmark reading assessment, um, but we know that for any adult or student, depending on how you're feeling, the, um, the effects of the day, the content, um, students can perform differently from one day to another. And so that's one of the pieces that we're looking at is, so how can we take all of these assessments given on different days and sometimes even different periods of time um, in order to bring, kind of normalize them and bring them into an overall index. And so that's something we're hoping we'll be able to share more with you next year at this time. Um, I was very impressed that NDSA was not embargoed. Um, at the beginning of June, I am used to most states having to go through the data themselves many times before they allow it to be public, which I think really makes it an advantage for us to look at that as we're aligning those ELOs as we go forward. So that timeliness is, is very important. Um, mathematics. Um, ABMR stands for Advantage Math Recovery, and we have been administering and teaching using the methods and strategies from Advantage Math Recovery or ABMR in our kindergarten through, through second grade specifically across the district now um, for the last three or four years. We have buildings that have been ABMR focused buildings um, that also include grade, grades three through five, but as a district, uh, K through two are the buildings that have had the primary focus and then we're continuing to expand that as I mentioned. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, grade two, um, they work on structuring. So they work through a series of measures just like with, with many of our Ames Web assessments. And at second grade, structuring is the grade level assessment. And so 
Um, you can see for each of those seasons, that's what each of the, um, the colored bars represents, blue being fall and green being spring, um, how many students performed at each of those levels. And ultimately, when we're looking at structuring, we want our students to be at a level three or higher. That's when we consider them proficient in the area of structuring before they move on. And so then likewise on the, on the right hand side of the screen, then you're able to see as our second uh, snapshot of our second graders across the district, um, what percentage of our second graders were at that level three through five, all of which would be considered proficient. I think with structuring number, to give you an example, it is allowing you to break down the number 20 in a variety of ways so you can use it. So a lot of times when you're asking someone to add 17 plus 32, they might take the tens together and then the ones and then put the whole number together if you didn't have paper and pencil in front of you. What we're trying to get away from is thinking that we always have to have a piece of paper and a pencil to write it down and we only know the one, carry the one. And we don't know why we do it, we just know that's what you do. Trying to give understanding to how we break down numbers and use them. And so then again, we have grades three through five for MAP. Um, same scenario as far as reading goes. It's an adaptive assessment that the questions get more rigorous the more they're answered correctly and become a little bit more lenient if there are errors. Um, so again, we can see as we move across the grade levels, the, the percent of our students that made yearly growth on the left and the number of percent of students that were proficient on the right. And again, wrapping up then with NDSA for math in all three grades, being able to compare how we as a district are performing compared to the state performance. Obviously, we've not received the state uh, uh, numbers for this school year, so that piece is yet to come. So I'm going to take a seat to write down your questions, if you have any, for us. I'll let Jen, if you don't mind staying up. Okay. Thank you. Anyone have questions or comments? John? With the map reading and map math, I've, uh, from these slides, seen the trend over the past few years sliding downward. Uh, is, do we have any idea what to attribute that to? So I think a couple things that we have to look at, I won't say that I'd be able to say exactly, but one, we do have now a misalignment of standards, I mean, or change in our standards. So we'll have to look to see, are the ELOs what we've selected, the ones that are what we need, um, and do we value that the same? If, if the value is not the same, then we might have to accept that the test won't reflect that as we go forward. So we do have to look at alignment. The other piece that we have is that we are um, becoming more and more diverse, and we're gonna have to look again at those shared practices and um, methods that we use to allow all students to get to the goals that we've set. And so that gets into our um, teaching strategies that we have a plan to work through, like we said, the ELOs and then um, shared practices in our buildings. And again, those are research-based that we wanna look at. Um, with uh, what we're seeing with growth and proficiency, I think in an ideal world, we would wanna see everybody 100% proficient, right, at the end of the year. That is, what's a realistic number and what, do we have internal metrics that we're aiming for? And are we hitting those or missing those, even if they are only 50% of our population? I'm gonna let Bob jump in if he would like on that one, because I know that one thing that I like to look at is national norms or state norms to see where we're at. But I also know that looking at student groups is also important because of the opportunity gap that we have. I think as we look at the entire population that we have the opportunity to serve, we need to look at um, the different groups of the students that we have. Some of our students um, are in our English learner program, and just by being in that program most likely will not be successful on uh, state assessment, or they may not be at grade level on a uh, MAP test, but that doesn't mean that we don't want them to continually make that year plus of growth. In fact, we want them to make that year plus so that they can catch up with their peer group. So on many of the slides that you had the opportunity to see, on the left-hand side when we talk about um, the number that made that year of growth, that was a much larger number than those that might be at that proficiency level. It is that push to get kids to catch up with 
those national norms. So it's very difficult to say, instead of 100%, it should be 80 or it should be 90, because each group of students will be a little bit different that we have the opportunity to serve. But to me, where we want to see that 100% or as close to it as possible would be those students making that year's worth of growth or more so that they catch up with their peer group. David? My question was very similar to, to John's. Dr. Gross, it, explain to me the, uh, the yearly growth numbers stayed virtually level, hardly changed at all. While the proficiency dropped, how, are, how can the proficiency level be dropping and yet we've got the same number of kids earning a year's growth? One thing as we look at the data we always talk about is how long has that student been in the Fargo public schools? And we know we have a very high mobility rate in Fargo. So does West Fargo and Moorhead. So as we look at that year of growth, that is our goal. And some of our students will be coming to us from other neighboring districts, might be coming from elsewhere, and they then might start at a lower level than some of their peers. That doesn't mean they can't make that year of growth. So that number being in the 80s percentage, again, trying to get as many of our students at that level, making that year's a gro year of growth doesn't mean automatically that you're going to be proficient. And sometimes it takes multiple years of a year plus of growth to get to that uh, level. And that's why we have talked um, from teaching and learning perspective and we shared with the board in the past that really we need to look at a trajectory of two to three years to say where is that student now? Where do they need to be at proficiency in those two to three years? And then what do we need to do internally to ensure that that student gets that year plus of growth so that they can catch up? So it's really where they have started compared to where we want them to be. And I'll just add to that, when we look at growth, you will not see some of our students in that number because they weren't with us the year before. Now, if they came from a North Dakota school, we could have that score, but if they moved in from a different state, they don't get counted because they don't have a previous score to calculate the growth off of. So it's a, re a little bit of a reduced number, and that's that mobility piece that we're talking about. And I'll just follow up with that piece as well. Even if they're coming to us from within the state, while we might have that number in the student's cumulative file, it's not part of the um, the export from, from NWEA or from Ames Web or whatever the, the assessment might be. So we don't have that number to calculate from. Robin. So what I'm seeing is that we are consistently outperforming the state's norms. Um, what I'm hearing is when you talk, you're talking about growth to target and you are talking about these are, the, the bar is moved every year. So you calibrate where they need to grow to. So it's not that they're just taking a year's worth of growth, it's a year's worth of growth to target. Is, 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 is that fair? So I think these are, these are promising numbers and it's just like the ACT recap, recalibrates every year and our kids rise to that level. So I, I don't see anything alarming at all in this report. I think it's very promising and I think growth to target is where we need to focus on. And just, talking about the diversity in our school district compared to maybe the rest of the states, um, I think that these are pretty, pretty excellent numbers. But that doesn't mean you're not always gonna try for more. Brian. Just out of curiosity, um, and I'm not sure if the word's right, um, in NWA testing, um, you use, um, is it Lexile scores? Um, where the student, is that the right word? We, we use the RIT scores. What we're, the information that you're looking at tonight is based off of the, the RIT, the Roche Index. But the Lexile scores, isn't that where the student, um, you can put the student, um, wh whatever that number is, then they can identify books that they should be reading. Um, do we do that? Um, or do we have that? in place. I, not so much, I don't want to know about the end result here, I just yep. want to know what goes on in the working progress. Right, so for our classroom teachers, they are able to take a look at that RIT score. They also can um, view it through the Lexile, um, and that opportunity is also available available through the Ames Web Plus. They can look at the Lexile scores there too. That helps them to make some of those instructional decisions about the types of books they're working um, instructionally with, with students upon. 
John. Dr. Gross, you mentioned having the two to three year trajectory gives a better picture. Um, I imagine in a, a district of our size, as many students we have, that's a pretty sophisticated and complicated ask. Is that a capability that we actually have today to do that? Or is that something we are working on? Or um, can you give me more information about that? Um, <clears throat> I, I would say the answer could be yes, very soon, that we could develop those individual growth paths for each of those students. Um, like we've talked about tonight, part of it though is a student needs to be with us for those three to four years in order to follow that entire path from third grade to seventh or second to sixth and so on. So we would not be able to have that for every student. We'd also have to look at that by assessment because each assessment will have a different scale score. When we talk about MAP and the RIT or the Rausch uh, unit is one, the state assessment is based on a different scale score. So each one of those would need to be calculated, um, but that is something that our um, director of um, data analysis has talked about that we've looked at and is something that um, hopefully we would be able to build into that system. Dr. Gandhi. Yeah, and I think Dr. Gross touched on that. I would say that Jen and Stephen, our, our director of data analysis, if um, although you can't just create a linear progression between crossing multiple assessments, um, if you look at some of our student data cards and the data walls that we have, that give you a comprehensive picture of every piece of information that we have for students since they've been in our system, that kind of gives you that progression of where do they fall under each assessment and the prog progress we've been making over time. And then I know, I don't know if Missy, you want to reconnect, but we fortunately don't have to do it all of ourselves. Other, there's also a source of information and some of this data might be lagging and it might not capture our entire district, but there is um, a tool that we use and I'll have Missy kind of projected behind me that will show you four students that stayed in your district over a certain amount of time, how that gives you a one composite number for growth that they've used. Um, and are you talking about the Stanford yep. research? Okay, I just have to hook up here. In 2017, Stanford did a very large study and it's asked the question, how effective are schools? And what was neat about the study is it calculated um, math and reading together as a single score mm -hmm. over a period of five years in, the, in your district. But if your state has a state test, you're part of the study um, as you go forward. So we can go down in this study, and this would show I have Fargo as a little yellow dot because I put it into their interactive wall, and it shows um, how, where we lie for the growth with third graders, okay? Now, they have these many charts that we can look at, but I just want to go down to um, where we actually do the interactive part. What I found interesting is you go into this tool and you can put in any district you like of any state. So I put Fargo in and it said that Fargo, for students that stay with us for five years from third grade to eighth grade, on average they make 4.8 years growth. And five is what we want. So we're, we're kind of you know right there. Um, but as you can see, there are some districts that have more and some that have less. Um, but I can put in a different state and a city and take a look at that also. But again, one of the points of the study is when they stay with us, um, the opportunity to provide for them is so much greater. So if we start separating the data by mobility, I think we have to ask ourselves some really hard questions about what can we do differently or how do we meet those needs? Because we're gonna, people are becoming more mobile um, for lots of different reasons. I would also add that that data is composite across the board. So um, districts that might have, for example, Fargo, a larger percent of students are ELL or a larger percent of students are special ed would all be part of that one composite piece of data as well. So there's some work that would need to be do to, done to tease out general population, special ed population as well, but just a good resource for us to have. Any other questions? Brian. Are we about, is that, 
all the testing then that we'll use is all these assessments just <laughs> right here is that that's enough we don't want to do any more or do we do want to know more assessments uh, honestly I don't think we need more I think we need more formative in the classroom that allows a teacher to change their um, trajectory or lessons to meet the needs of their students and I think that's why we're getting into the ELOs so that we can be very responsive as we go forward and I'll let Jen share just a little bit because we probably do a few other yeah. pieces. And some of you may recall a few years ago we did a study on the assessments that we were giving, really taking a look at the number of minutes that those assessments take over the course of, of a school year and how much instructional time is also lost as a result of administering assessments. And so as a result, that continues to be something that we look at every year um, with, our, with our teachers and administrators and, and instructional coaches to really determine so that even moving into next year, we're taking a look and saying, here are some assessments, some specifically some screening measures that we really aren't using the results from. They're taking time away from the instruction. So let's stop giving them and let's give back that instructional time to the teachers to do what they need to be doing with students. All right, thank you very much. Great information. On the consent, uh, moving on to the consent agenda, is there a motion for approval? <coughs> and is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda. All in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. On to business. Item A, assignment of canvassing committee memo 110. Is there a motion? I move that we accept the assignment of canvassing committee with John Rodenbiker as serving as chair as per GP-2E. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Anne-Marie, please call the roll. Robin Nelson? Yes. Paulson? Yes. Rodenbiker? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Ani? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Brian Nelson? Yes. Knutson? Yes. Motion passes. 6B, GP7 Committee Structure Monitoring, Memo 107. There was a recommendation at uh, governance from uh, a review of board policy GP7 that there be a slight change. Let's see, is that redlined on here? Where is that? Where is that change? Or no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, goodness. Yes, I was moving ahead. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Jim, go ahead. Um, Mac microphone. microphone. If you look at the negotiating committee, uh, which is paragraph four under A we maybe want to clean up some language here. Uh, we say in A, the FEA, and then in two, uh, or in one we say the FEA, and then in two, the recognized representative organization, which traditionally has been the FEA. But I wonder if we shouldn't change FEA to be the recognized representative organization in number one, just in case the day would ever come when there's another one. John? Just a point of order. Do we need to have a motion on the table to discuss this? Only if we're going to change something. Uh, okay. Robin? I'm going to have some recommendations for another committee as well. So I intend to just let us know how you want us to handle it. I'm, I'm going to ask that it goes to governance for review. Which is probably what I'd do with this one, too. Okay, so there is a, there's a recommendation regarding number four, negotiations committee to work on the language uh, where uh, FEA, Fargo Education Association, is replaced. That's in number one, Jim, yep. with recognized representative organization. Yep. And was that it for yep. that one? Okay. Robin? Sure, on the communications committee, I... Um, when I returned to the board, uh, I obviously stayed in touch with a lot of the activity with the board. 
Uh, during my two years off. And so what I watched was uh, a series of conversations about the communications committee and whether it should be disbanded, what the means should be. And at that time, the, the board decided it would not send a very good message to disband our communications committee. And I agree with that in concept. However, we currently have a communications committee through no one's fault whatsoever, um, more so with the outstanding job that our communications uh, administrative team does that I think we really need to look at the means for this committee. So um, I would I, I would like the gov governance committee to look at the means and and let me explain myself. What I am seeing is this committee is trying to make itself relevant and and looking for topics to to work on. And I would say just to say to our community that we have a com communications committee that isn't as functional as it should be is almost more disingenuous than to not have a committee itself. So I, again, I'm not disparaging any work the committee has done or anybody that's on it, but I really think we need to take a hard look at the means. So I, I would hope that we talk about that in governance. Okay, point taken. Anyone else have any discussion? Brian. I would just echo what Robin said. I, I think you said that very well. I mean, I find being on that committee trying to understand what what it is we're doing on that, so. And I, too, I'm not blaming anybody, because yeah. I'm part of that committee. Okay, thank you, Brian. Jim? That we direct GP7 to our governance committee for review of the items identified in tonight's discussion for possible modification and bring it back to the board with a recommendation. Second. second. Okay, there's been a motion by Jim, a second by Robin. Any discussion? Anne Marie, please call the roll. Paulson? Yes. Rodenbaker? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Ani? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Brian Nelson? Yes. Robin Nelson? Yes. Knutson? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, now we have a recommended change. Business item 6C, EL6 changes memo 108. And so the, uh, the change is on the back side of the memo. It's on item number three. Is there a motion for approval? John. I move that EL6 be approved as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, sig any discussion? Okay, Anne-Marie, please call the roll. Rodenbiker? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Ani? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Brian Nelson? Yes. Robin Nelson? Yes. Paulson? Yes. Knutson? Yes, motion passes. Item D, HR actions. David? I just wanted to, to point out what I think is a, an area of concern. Four years ago, we did a standards, or we had a standards and efforts report given to us. At that time, it showed that comparing uh, the three districts, Fargo, West Fargo, and Moorhead, Fargo had more administrators than the others when comparing the number of students or equalizing the number of students. Now I look at the new hires and I see that we have added two deans of students. There should be four more coming, I would assume. We've added a special ed assistant director and we've added a special ed coordinator. Just doing the rough math in my head, that comes up to about $370,000 worth of salary at the same time, we added special ed positions totaling 170, and that's not uh, taking away the two resignations we've had. I, I see this continuing to occur. We keep adding more administrators, and we need, we know that, especially with setting D coming up, we're going to need counselors, we're going to need social workers, we're going to need psychologists, we need people working directly with the students, and yet we're spending so much of 
our salary money adding more administrators. I, that concerns me. It may not bother anybody else, but I just wanted to be on record as stating that. Mr. Gandhi. Absolutely, I appreciate you kind of sharing that concern. Um, just some context around some of the positions. Um, when we look at a standard of effort with uh, our neighboring districts, the assistant SPED director is a position that we didn't have that, that West Fargo does. Looking at the dean positions, they are not to be solely in isolation as an ad. The dean positions are an upgrade from the opportunity we already provide some teachers in a leadership opportunity. We have an admin intern program in our district. Um, essentially what happens is the teachers for two years work as an administrator on a building and then they go back into their teaching position by design. Well, that program wasn't sustainable, especially with our growing needs that we have. Um, we had principals that were saying that they're helping teachers that want leadership opportunities become administrators, but then two years later, they're going back into the classroom. And some of the work that they've done and some of the momentum they built hasn't really been able to be sustained because every two years you have a different admin intern. So the Dean program is designed to go in conjunction with phasing out the admin intern program. So the deans that we're hiring this year are the second year admin interns that are no longer in that program. Point of order, Robin. Can we have a motion on the floor before we discuss this? And, and, or out of respect for everybody, I, I would like to move that we accept the human resources uh, list on the board agenda as well as the board addendum. Perfect, is there second. a second? Christy, okay. Now we may continue discussion. Mm -hmm. Robin. I would be interested to know, uh, thank you for bringing that up, and uh, I hope you don't think this is any disrespect um, to have a motion on the floor before we discuss. Um, I, I would also, I, I, I see what you're saying. I would like to see the ratios that are, that are uh, suggested for best practices, because I know we have so many counselors per student and, and everything else. And I would like us to compare our benchmarks to those best practice standards in, in, in addition to watching the trends as well. Anyone else have comments to make? Brian. <clears throat> I thought uh, a couple of months ago you had alluded to this uh, program. I, you were going to change it because of what you just said. Was did I hear that wrong? No, that's correct. David? Just, I'm aware of the administrative intern position, but correct me if I'm wrong. I thought that when they were serving as administrative interns, are they not still on the teacher's salary schedule? They are, and that's part of um, the concern as well is that they're getting administrative experience and doing administrative duties on a campus. Um, should that be the best model? Any other discussion? Okay, Anne-Marie, please call the roll. Ulrich? Yes. Ani? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Brian Nelson? Yes. Robin Nelson? Yes. Paulson? Yes. Rodenbiker? Yes. Knutson? Yes. Motion passes. Board reports, committee liaison and correspondence reports. Jim. Um, well, not a lot since the last meeting. We had a planning committee that I attended. And uh, I don't know if you're all aware of what's going on at the Holiday Inn right now, but we're in day two of a three-day MTSS conference. Uh, I think they had 482 registered attendees. Um, a lot of good sessions going on out there. Um, I attended about half of today's and learned a whole new technique for getting my social emotional core put back together myself as an adult. Uh, I got to go get a playlist. It was going to start with the Grateful Dead and it's going to end with Johnny Hartford. And then whenever people irritate me, I'm supposed to listen to it. So. I may have to have headphones on at the next meeting. <laughs> no, it, it, I think it's a really good conference. Uh, it's being put on in conjunction with a couple of the REAs. Uh, SEEC is the lead organization for it. Um, so 
pretty uh, a lot of pretty excited educators at the Fargo Holiday Inn today and tomorrow. And uh, well, I'm not sure how many shopping days are left, but the picnic is getting dangerously close. Yeah. And that's it for my report. Yeah, it's fast approaching August 8th. Christy. Thank you. Uh, I was at the planning committee meeting. We had our uh, negotiations meeting last week as well. And we had our last task force meeting, which was number seven uh, for the building usage and capacity. Those, uh, nothing reached consensus at that meeting. Therefore, uh, the entire packet of what we've done and what we've studied will be brought forth to the uh, work session this summer. And as a board, we will discuss what our options are and what we want to do moving forward. Thank you, Christy. Brandy. I don't have anything except for graduation. Um, it was nice I got to um, give my son his diploma. So that was pretty exciting for the family and, and for him. And it was super awesome because he, I knew a lot of the kids that I did give the diplomas to. So um, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. Congratulations to your son, Brian. Oh, uh, just Fargo South graduation. I got to hand out diplomas with David Paulson and he got to lead first. So um, I knew what I was doing. So. Thanks. David. Planning negotiations and negotiations is now on hold for the foreseeable future. John. Thank you. Um, yes, I was also at that negotiations meeting with the FEA on June 3rd um, to address some things that I've, I've heard, had questions from, seen in, in some media. Uh, we're not stalled. We're not at impasse. Uh, there are three topics still on the table. A uh, topic regarding leave days, some language regarding the structure of the work day and preparation and planning time, and salary. Um, the next meeting has been scheduled. We'll be meeting with them again on uh, August 26th. If not sooner, we, the board, remain willing to uh, meet with them uh, earlier if their schedules change or they have some availability before then. Uh, and our goal still is to hope to come to a two-year agreement with the FEA as soon as possible. So uh, let's report from that. Uh, I was able to attend the Metro Tech Camp on June 6th, last Thursday. Um, camp is definitely a misnomer for this now. This is a full-blown conference. It was incredible. Um, you speak about your experiences, Jim, over at the Holiday Inn. Uh, I want to thank uh, Moorhead Public Schools for uh, using Horizon Middle School for this uh, joint project between Moorhead, Fargo, West Fargo, and I believe also Dilworth, uh, Glendon Felton Public School Districts. Hundreds of teachers, dozens of sessions, really, really excited people, lots of conversation about how to use technology to enhance the outcomes of our, our kids in our schools. Um, I, I sat in on a few different ones, what a really neat one um, about uh, building digital books and putting them on the websites, to build your own curriculum, your own uh, language art programs, a really cool session about accessibility and how new technology uh, really, creates opportunities for um, d disabled kids. And one of the really neat things about that was we have uh, kind of a, a rock star here in our district, in the district, but it's sitting in, in the city of Fargo um, who uses some of these technologies and helps teach educators how to use them. She was featured in one of Apple's uh, keynote videos that they do about the possibilities of accessible technology. And she actually edited that only through the use of uh, switches. Um, you think of making a movie and you need to have, you know, mouse and keyboard and everything. So um, and it was great to see how packed that session was of teachers wanting to learn how to use assistive technologies for their kids. And overall, just, I mean, really, this is no longer a camp. This is a conference. Uh, kudos to all of the organizers, to everybody who led a session, uh, to all the teachers that took some time and, and, and attended that. Just really, really impressive and good work, everybody. Um, 
And then I also attended the planning committee on Friday. That is my update. Thank you. Thank you, John. Robin. Uh, I, along with Brandy, got to hand out diplomas at North High on June 2nd. I had to pull her away from all the kids she wanted to hand diplomas to, but she was very gracious. It was fun. I attended the governance com committee meeting on May 23rd. Uh, just a little update on state PTA. I assume we will no longer have a city liaison for the board, but I have agreed to be their state legislative chair. Uh, that may or may not be related uh, to our board assignments. Fargo Cass Public Health, uh, the executive director and another administrator asked to meet with me on, on May 29th to, for some legislative coaching and some input, so I'm trying to help them out with that. We had a regular meeting of the Fargo Cass Public Health meeting on May 31st, and then today I also provided them with some le inter interim legislative information grouped by their topics. I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit. As far as Government Affairs Committee, um, before I get started on the handout, today the Workforce Development Council met and there were a couple of speakers. Wade Sick was one of them. He's from the North Dakota Department of, of CTE. Be really careful, you guys, because I've already messed this up. There's CDE and CTE, Career and Tech Ed, uh, and Center for Distance uh, Education or Center for Distance Learning. So, But we're educations all over the place, Marketplace for Kids, Train North Dakota, um, so if you see any of those Workforce Development Council meetings, I encourage you to uh, start to watch those because we, we are going to be working with a lot of those people, especially if we're talking about a Career Workforce Academy. Uh, I, I sent around a, a list, let me back up, today or yesterday the announcements for the State Legislative Interim Committee studies uh, were assigned. And what I did is I went through and I provided you with a handout of what I thought our board should and governmental affairs committee should be looking at over the next, the interim session. Um, so there are, I grouped them by topic and uh, committee, if you will. Um, so I'll let you go through this. Uh, maybe we can dig into it a little bit more at our next GAC meeting. But I do have a question, uh, particularly for John and possibly Jim. Um, I want you to look at the IT stuff and see if we need to add that in, because we know how excited we just <laughs> heard you. And then uh, talking about ND PERS as well, I don't know how much we want to make that one of our priorities as well, but some of the highlights, obviously the education funding formula, school transportation, student behavioral health, and behavioral health systems. Now I grouped these on my own, I did not get the Government Affairs Committee to uh, bless these, if you will, these are just my suggestions. Um, and then I, I, I think we should monitor the Legacy Fund and the Ethics Committee as well. We won't have that much emphasis in those, but we need to follow the rules of the Ethics Committee and then the Legacy Fund is, well, everybody's watching that. So this is merely a preview of what I think we'll be working on this session. I don't know how the interim session uh, works, and so I will learn as I go, and I hope that anybody else can help coach me along the way, but looking for feedback on these, on those two items in particular. Now, just so you know how those committees are chosen, the legislative, uh, what is it called? Legislative Council assigns each legislator to one of those committees, and they list their top three plus one of their committees that they wanna be on, and that they're, they're kinda divvied out in that way. So they're, they're rolling, and just because they're not in session doesn't mean they're not, they're not working. And it, at, where there aren't any GAC meetings scheduled until we learn a little bit more specifics on, on how this works. Jim, did you have something to add, Dan? Yeah, Robin, there was one more you want to probably put on our list to keep track of. Um, the taxation group Kay. is actually going to work uh, based on resolution 1474 on looking for alternatives to special assessments. Kay. And this one is being sparked in large part by some legislators from Cass County. Um, and obviously, we pay special assessments, but depending upon what tool they might come up with to eliminate them, it may have ramifications to all subdivisions of government as well. So I think it should be on our radar to at least see where that conversation goes to. Do you recommend we're heavily involved in that conversation or more monitoring uh, uh, of it? Probably right there with the Ethics and Legacy Fund. Kay monitor in case we have to get loud. Thank you. 
John. This is more of a question and I don't want to spur a discussion that's more suited for a GAC committee, but has Fargo Public Schools ever in the interim drafted our own proposed legislation for any given topic? And is that something that would be a role of the district? I know other interested parties can do do that, draft what they would like to see and hand it off to a legislator for delivery to the floor. Is that something that we've done or would want to consider? Jim has history here. Uh, How the answer is yes. It is something we've done. Um, limited success. We've had more success putting it forward as a resolution to the State School Boards Association, getting the entire association on board. Uh, those just about always come to fruition with good things. Um, but there are a few along the way that we have pushed forward ourselves. Uh, the last one, which we were unsuccessful on, uh, was trying to get the mandatory school age changed. So 16-year-olds couldn't just walk out of the building on their birthday, and everybody in North Dakota thought it was fine. Um, but they still thought it was fine, quite frankly, because the administrators fought against it, because the kids that were leaving the building, they didn't want to keep in the building in some cases. And finally, um, just from a Fargo Cass public health uh, legislative aspect, we're watching maybe six or seven studies. I grouped theirs together today. They have 15. So they're going to be really, I mean, everything from sewer treatment systems to behavioral health to uh, alternative tax for liquid nicotine to recreational marijuana. So I might be busier legislatively on that board than I am on this one. Hard to imagine. but. I'm, I'm just saying, telling you guys that because our work isn't nearly as in-depth as theirs. Hope that makes you feel good. That's all I have. Thank you, Robin. All right, as far as my report, the written report's been passed out. I know there was a letter, too, that I sent around that came from, uh, I think it was a student. Is that, maybe Anne-Marie has it? Okay, a previous student. So I had a chance to take a look at that. We're, Trying to get the work session dates set up, uh, I think that we'll, we might even have information for you for tomorrow morning, but it's looking like the 11th or the 15th of July. Uh, Native American Commission met last Thursday. I also went to the, uh, one of the uh, classes at the Metro Tech Camp, and John, you uh, gave it a great explanation and all the accolades. I echo what you said. When I walked in, even though it was for the last session of the day, there were people everywhere, just like so much energy and activity. It was, it was really fun to walk into. Uh, I cannot remember the, the title of the session that I attended exactly, but it focused on gender perceptions and biases and how technology plays a role with that. So we talked about um, students on Facebook or any Instagram or anything like that, taking selfies, um, how students, or, or specifically students, but also could be adults, of course, um, you know, what, what kind of a look are we trying to get or are students trying to get from posting specific pictures or talking about specific activities and how does that play into how they feel and just kind of deeper conversations that, uh, that teachers are looking at uh, having within the classroom suggestions. And so it, it went quite deep and we were able to break out into small groups and have some really good conversations. And it was, it was very, uh, very, very enlightening. I was able to shed some tears at the Woodrow graduation Happy Tears <laughs> with John. That was a, a very uh, nice time, of course, to kick off for those other three graduations we had. Let's see here. I wanted to mention, too, just to build on the task force finishing up. So again, thanks to everyone that community members participating in that task force. And then you will have noted that there was a message map and notes that were sent out uh, with Mr. Gandhi's last weekly update, so just take a look at that. And um, anything that you're looking at in terms of information, I know you've mentioned this, Rupak, previously, but that you think you might need, 
um, or that would be helpful to our whole group as we are preparing for that work session, please send suggestions to Rupak. If you want to copy them to me, that would be fine as well. I know I've sent a few ideas through, so uh, try to do that so that we can do as much work and preparation ahead of time so that we can have a really good thorough conversation when we meet either again the 11th or the 15th. And I believe that's it for my report. Is there anything else that we need to be discussing this evening? Christy. Uh, Jackie is in the middle of preparing our preliminary budget. And so to the planning committee meeting members, I'm wondering if next Wednesday or Thursday would work for a meeting. That be at 7:30 in the morning. Yes, it could be. I can make either of those days work. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, Wednesday is going to be a problem until about nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. But Thursday should work. Okay, then let's do it on Thursday. Let's do 7.30 Thursday morning. Next Thursday. Next That's Thursday. Thursday. Okay. Not this Thursday? No, the 25th. Uh, the 20th? The 20th, yes. I'm in July. The 20th. Okay, so the 20th of June at 7.30 a.m. for Correct. the next planning committee meeting. Yes. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone have anything else? John. I will not be making a motion to enter executive session this evening. If anybody else wants to make a motion, I would let you feel free to do that. Well, it looks like we've completed everything on our agenda then. It's 6.35 p.m. Our next meeting is June 25th at 5.30 p.m. And we're adjourned. Thank you.